All right, I consent. And here we go. And good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and call this session of the City of Cedro Woolley Hearing Examiner to order. For the record, today is January 12th, 2022. Still getting used to saying that at 3 p.m. We have one item on the agenda today. This is number LP 2021067 involving a request for approval of a preliminary plat known as the Bucko Estates that would allow for the subdivision of a 19.6 acre property into 64 residential lots, including 60 single family lots and four duplex lots, along with other associated appurtenances and improvements at 503 and 505 FNS Grade Road uh, here in Cedro Woolley. And this proposal would be developed in three phases. My name is Andrew Reeves. I'm a hearing examiner with Sound Law Center, who the city has selected to hold certain land use application hearings like this one. And today it will be my role to collect evidence in the form of exhibits and testimony to determine whether this proposal complies with the city's comprehensive plan, zoning ordinances, critical areas ordinances, and the specific criteria for approval of a preliminary plat under chapters 1604 and 1608 of the Cedro Woolley Municipal Code, as well as the other ordinances in the Municipal Code. In addition, because the proposal involves the subdivision of land, ensure that it complies with our State Subdivision Act, which is in chapter 5817 of the Revised Code of Washington. Uh, in advance of the hearing, I received 16 exhibits that I had an opportunity to review, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail, but uh, those included a staff report prepared by city staff, the application materials themselves, information on the checklist that was prepared uh, under our state's Environmental Policy Act, or SEPA, along with the SEPA determination, uh, mitigated determination of non-significance or MDNS that was ultimately issued. Uh, public comments, and there were uh, several, and uh, I am going, I had two new ones that came in in the last uh, two days, I would say, uh, and I intend on just adding them into uh, what has been identified from the staff as Exhibit E. That would be my intent. Uh, but uh, I did review all these comments. These includes comment, include comments from uh, Michelle Batchelor, uh, Patrick Hayden, and Cohen, uh, Mary and Kevin McGoffin, Yvonne and Glenn Michael, uh, Gay Gaylene and Sean Ronk, and I think they had a couple that were submitted. Uh, from the SRSC uh, Skagit River System Cooperative, uh, the Cedro Woolley School District, uh, Department of Ecology. Um, let's see, did I miss anyone? I think. Let's see, another comment from the Rocks and Patrick Hayden again. So I think that's all of them, but uh, should anyone have additional comments uh, or exhibits that they wanted admitted into the record, let me know when it's your opportunity to testify. And I'll go ahead and address, address admitting additional exhibits at that time. I got off track there. Uh, the other things that I reviewed in advance were the developer agreements that has been prepared uh, in advance related to sort of the road system and phasing. In addition, the application materials, including the preliminary plat map, uh, and then various uh, reports, including a critical areas assessment and mitigation plan uh, and additional information of a technical nature. So those exhibits will be deemed admitted. As I said, if there are others, let me know. Uh, speaking of testimony as well, all testimony today will be under oath or affirmation. Uh, essentially everyone but our attorney, Mr. Schutz, will be sworn in if you are going to testify. Uh, attorneys, uh, don't get sworn in. They, uh, uh, I'm not listening to them for uh, purposes of the facts, if you will. Uh, they can make legal arguments and they can call on folks on their team, but uh, they're not here essentially to provide facts. So I'll just clarify that. And uh, I may ask questions of those that are participating. I'm not trying to trip anyone up. I'm just trying to ensure I have a thorough understanding of the proposal so that within 10 business days of the record closing, I'm able to produce a decision that is hopefully clear and legally defensible. Uh, the order that we typically follow, and I believe we're gonna follow today is first, I'll hear from city staff who will sort of give an overview of the proposal and 
discuss uh, the review that occurred uh, in advance of our hearing today. Then I'll turn it over to Mr. Schutz on behalf of the applicants uh, to present any arguments and call on any witnesses that he would like to call upon. Uh, then we will see if there are members of the public interested in testifying, and if so, they will have that opportunity at that time. Folks will remain muted until we get to uh, the various points in the hearing where it is appropriate to hear from others. Uh, that's the, the way this would work, even if we were all in the same room, uh, but uh, with the remote meeting technology to ensure there's no crosstalk or talking over each other, I will try very clearly to indicate who I would like to hear from so that everyone knows what's going on. And as I stated, mem for members of the public, if you are interested in testifying, you will have that opportunity in, we'll call it the third leg of the uh, proceedings after we hear from city staff and the applicant. And then if appropriate and necessary, at the end, after hearing from members of the public, I'll go back to applicant representative and city staff to respond to any such testimony. Uh, finally, I note that uh, clearly there are differences of opinion not just in the city of Cedro Woolley, but everywhere in Washington when it comes to how development should occur. Uh, and that's clearly understandable, but I do ask everyone to treat uh, each other with respect and civility. We're not in a courtroom, but you know we're, we're trying our best to ensure that we all get along and I will try to facilitate that. I think this is the kind of group that can handle that. Uh, haven't had many problems in Cedro Woolley with that kind of thing. Uh, in the past, but I always do like to note it and remind everybody of that. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and get Mr. Coleman sworn in and we'll get started. And thank you for being here, sir. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in the testimony you give here today? Yes. Thank you. And can you just clearly spell your name for the audio recording and then explain what your role is here at the city? I am John Coleman. J-O-H-N-C-O-L-E-M-A-N, the planning director for the city of Cedar Woolley. Thank you. And I may uh, turn my video feed off at various points. I'm not disappearing. Uh, I do have a face for radio, and it's just a way to ensure I'm not distracting anyone, but know that I am definitely listening and still here. Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Coleman. Go right ahead. All right. So uh, this uh, this project as... Uh, as described in the staff report, I think we, I think the staff report says it also. Hopefully, everybody had a chance to review it thoroughly. Um, clearly, the hearing examiner described the basics of it, so I'm not going to go too much into the details of the uh, of the project itself. What I do want to say is um, this project has been thoroughly reviewed by staff by um, the applicant, there's been a lot of back and forth and a lot of cooperation between this, the, the city and, this, and the applicant to uh, get, to the, get this project to where it is right now. Um, clearly, you can see from the staff recommendations um, on this project that staff in the city are supportive of this project. Uh, you can probably tell from the procedural history involved that um, there's been a lot of details and a lot of uh, back and forth information. And uh, you, that's really borne out in the developer's agreement that uh, goes along with this project. Uh, the developer's agreement was intended uh, to clarify everybody's position and really get everybody in agreement on where to go and who does what, and a lot of details uh, have been, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears have been put into this project. Uh, the developer agreement uh, that I provided a copy of in the, in the staff report is an unsigned agreement. It, it's just going through the process of being uh, approved by the, the, the city uh, and the applicant, but there, uh, there's been good faith towards that. The city council has already uh, approved the developer agreement. Uh, there is just a technical change that has occurred. Uh, so we don't have a final change. And so for the hearing examiner's benefit, uh, you will notice that this project is uh, ultimate is owned by Bucko Survivor Trust. 
the members of the Bucko Survivor Trust have changed the LLC name. And um, if you want, you can ask them more about the procedural history of that. But it is now uh, officially owned per, uh, for legal purposes, though it doesn't yet show in the assessor's page that it is the Bucko Property LLC. So if you have any curiosity about why the name change, um, you can ask the applicant. We, um, we are still waiting technically. Uh, we, we don't anticipate any errors or problems, but we, we're still technically waiting for you know, the paperwork on that to come through so we uh, can tell who uh, is involved in all. But it has looked it up on the Secretary of State page and the applicants, uh, the, the, the representatives of, of that LLC are Sarah and Laura Bucko who are, of course, the people involved in Bucko Survivor Trust. So there's nothing unusual. It's just a change of name. Sure. And just to be clear on that point, Mr. Coleman, in some jurisdictions that I work in, uh, the hearing examiner gets involved with development agreements or developer agreements. My understanding here is I, I'm not putting any sort of my stamp of approval or anything on that on the developer agreement. Uh, the agreement is between, you know, uh, I guess it will be Bucko Property LLC and the city, and obviously it, it impacts this proposal and, and clarifies a whole lot of things, but, you know, I'm only looking at it in terms of the overall criteria for a review for the plat itself, as opposed to you're not nobody's waiting on me to sign off on this thing. Am I understanding that accurately, Mr. You're Coleman? understanding that accurately, um, and, you, and you portrayed it accurately also. We provided this in the, uh, in the hearing examiner documentation because it provides a lot of details and fills in a lot of blanks, and we thought it was very useful and important to the understanding of this overall project. Sure. There it is. Was, Thank you for clarifying. Go right ahead. So, um, Aside from the name change, uh, and there'll be some documentation that goes along with that with the application uh, as well, um, everything is as described in the hearings examiner staff report. We, um, as staff and as a city, we're, we're supportive of the project. Um, as you can tell from the developer agreement and the staff report, um, this project uh, incorporates a, an, a provision of an arterial road that goes from the northern part of this property to Cook Road, and that is described in our city comprehensive plan transportation element as a planned route. And so the negotiations about how, um, you know, the costs born of that and how it affects this plat was pretty key to um, the staff report and developer agreement. So those things are, um, are, are well thought out and, and hopefully well described and understood through the, uh, through the documentation. Um, so staff is supportive of this project still, and as I said, and uh, we just included some staff recommendations that I'll go through here briefly. Um, for the record, um, the, uh, you can see on uh, page 13 of the, the staff report, the recommendations written out clearly, uh, all development shall be shall generally conform to the preliminary plat map as shown in exhibit H, that's kind of boilerplate normal stuff, um, comply with the mitigation measures in, in the SEPA MDNS, um, provide an eight foot wide crushed rock trail on the outer edge of the buffer area on the south side of Brickyard Creek, and I'm gonna come back to these. I think I'll just read them through here to, uh, to begin with. Um, actually, I'm not gonna read through all of them because some of them are kind of technical aspects um, as far as you know, um, providing certain things that were part of the, the, the process of going through back and forth with the application, uh, with the applicants as we reviewed this and they said they wanted to, to see some of these things instead of showing it in the paperwork at the time uh, to show it later. Um, 
and uh, ask for the, ask for them to be instead of shown in in the preliminary plat to be just required conditions of the uh, of the plat approval, with one notable exception of uh, of the the provide an eight foot wide crushed rock trail. So that's going to be the issue that we probably hear a lot about. Um, so when this project was originally proposed, there was a trail going through the uh, proposed through the protected critical area, kind of meandering through the middle of it. We got uh, comments from um, the, um, trying to think of the Skagit River Systems Co-op saying that they didn't like the trail going through the middle of the critical area because it uh, creates fra uh, habitat fragmentation. And so the applicant removed it from the from the applicant application materials and, and subsequent um, submittals. Now um, the, the the city has uh, reasons to to want that trail. One, we maintain Brickyard Creek as uh, also a drainage course, so we do need to get into. The, uh, near the creek to remove large woody debris or blockages, et cetera, um, for maintenance of that water course. So uh, being, uh, being a trail through there allows the city access to do its maintenance. Also that uh, it, it's it would be necessary access for the uh, homeowners, association, homeowners association that will be maintaining the uh, the critical area. As part of the, the project application, what you can see is that the, uh, the, the protected critical area is a standard 110 foot buffer, but they're allowed to reduce it down to 55 feet by providing enhanced mitigation. So right now that area is mostly grass, um, some blackberry, and just un, unmaintained, not great habitat area. So as part of that, they're going to be improving it per the critical areas maintenance and uh, uh, plan to plant trees. And that's going to make going to require maintenance. So we wanted to have a trail to allow the uh, homeowners association to be able to get in there and, and maintain the plantings, which is an important part of keeping them healthy. Um, also, we've received public comments stating an interest in having uh, a trail through that area, which staff does see as a benefit to the community. And as requested, we think that also lends support to having a trail through that area. As mentioned before, the Skagit River Systems Co-op had said that they didn't want it going through the middle of the buffer, but the documentation shows that they're supportive of having uh, the trail on the edge of the buffer area. That no longer creates the, the fragmentation issue. So they were okay with that and actually support having a trail there for the reasons stated in their letter as well. So uh, that's why staff is interested in and uh, requests that to be a requirement of the plat approval. Aside from that, um, there's not a not a whole lot of can, not a whole lot of uh, other things that the st that staff has to present on this uh, plot. I'm sure you'll have some questions so far away. Okay, so that concluded uh, your comments. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Uh, you actually covered some of what I was going to ask about. Um, but in terms of if we I guess start with that trail that has been proposed. Um, it's referenced in your recommended conditions of approval as number three, and it states that this uh, trail, uh, eight foot wide crushed rock trail on the outer edge of the buffer area, you know, should be provided. And I, I guess I'm hoping to get a little more specificity on what is meant by the outer edge of the buffer area. In some jurisdictions, uh, this is 
dealt with in their critical areas code explicitly as to you know what is allowed in certain portions of a critical area buffer. I don't know off the top of my head if if it is so addressed in your municipal code, but in as a for example, a lot of jurisdictions would allow something like this, a trail in the outer 25% of the buffer area. Um, but in terms of you know what we're going to ultimately uh, you know what would potentially be allowed were I to approve this uh, proposal I think some specificity on what counts as the outer edge would be helpful do you have any thoughts on what that would constitute so um, yeah it's it's uh, within the buffer area but on the outside periphery of the the 55 foot um, buffer area so if it's 55 feet wide and the passive recreation trail, which are allowed in our critical areas for critical areas ordinance, um, does uh, that would be, you know, with the, the outside 48 feet, you know, there'd be 48 feet of, of enhanced area and then eight feet of crushed rock trail. Okay, so in your mind, it's the very edge the trail is at the, the, it would be the eight feet adjacent to um, within the lots themselves. Within, that, within, within the buffer area. But essentially you've got 55 feet of buffer. Uh, here's Brickyard Creek, you know, 47 feet of buffer, uh, enhanced buffer. And then that last eight feet before you, you know, hit the lots themselves, uh, that would be where the trail goes. Is that a correct understanding? Absolutely correct. Okay. So I, I will, we'll ask Mr. Schutz in a minute about that, but I think I understand now and I may, you know, clarify that, that, that uh, recommended condition, you know, with that understanding, just so it's abundantly clear what the intent is. So there's, you know, no confusion down the road. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I appreciate the clarification. Sure. And I guess in that same sort of line there, are, are there any requirements on protecting critical areas in perpetuity with something like fencing, anything to that extent? And if so, could could you provide any detail about that? Uh, no, we didn't have any any anything specific in mind. Okay. Um, with the exception of there are sign there is signage required along the edge of a of a critical area, but I I, I'm not not entirely sure that our critical areas ordinance requires a fence. If it does, you know that'll be part of just the project application. Right. the The project shall comply with all of the critical areas requirements uh, as part of this. I was just trying to make sure it's clear that. Uh, well, I guess one other thought too is. Uh, you know, are these, um, is this critical area being set aside as it were in its own tract, uh, anything to that extent? Often, you know, you'll have what in a lot of jurisdictions are known as NGPAs or native growth protection areas, but essentially you, you put them in their own tract and there's language, you know, on the face of the plat itself that essentially says, you know, this is a protected area, it shall be so protected in perpetuity, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, has any thought been given to that? Yes, that, that, that language will be included um, and the Homeowners Association will own the protected critical area tracts. Okay, so the tracts don't get dedicated uh, to someone else or the city, they're gonna be maintained by the homeowners association is the expectation um, but also that these are protected critical areas they, they will be dedicated to the homeowners association owned and maintained by the by the homeowners association for the critical areas ordinance requirements sure and if uh a bunch of uh no good nicks move in and aren't taking care of it god forbid we don't want that to happen but if it happened uh, does the city have a way to go in and, you know, take care of things itself if, uh, you know, the HOA is not doing what it is intended to do? 
Yes, the critical areas ordinance does have uh, requirements for maintaining and um, and uh, looking it up real quick to, to see uh, enforcement measures. There is a article seven of the critical areas ordinance is uh, compliance and enforcement. Okay, so there it, there is a mechanism in a way by which uh, uh, you know if if there's something bad happening or nothing is happening but things should be happening uh, to ensure that uh, Brickyard Creek is appropriately protected uh, in the future is the basic concept, correct? Yes, we have a comprehensive critical areas ordinance that has a hammer to make sure that it's uh, maintained properly. <laughs> I like has a hammer. Okay, that makes sense. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, the developer agreement again is quite detailed, and as you explained, uh, you know, the you expect it'll it'll go through without substantive changes to the document. It's more of a, a technical issue in terms of the you know name of the party is that accurate right yeah so the the city council has already approved it right and then we learned of the name change so we're sending it back to them just uh, as a consent agenda item to to show that the document is changing um however not substantively got it thank you for clarifying that uh, another question i had had to do with the comment in particular that I received in advance from the uh, school district um, in terms of, I guess, is it a bus depot? Yeah, so adjacent to this property, adjacent to, this property to the west is, uh, well, really the southwest is the, the school bus facility. So they park their buses there at night, which means they also operate their buses out of there and buses can be noisy. Um, so the school districts, I believe the intent of the school district letter was to say, um, you know, it's a, a sort of a non-disclosure, hey, um, we're, we operate buses here and we, we don't want to, to receive any complaints about us running our buses here in the future. Sure, I guess my thinking, and, and I can also uh, get your thoughts and later Mr. Schitz's thoughts on this, you know, in circumstances like this, one option is to include language, you know, on the face of the plat, identifying this as a pre-existing use, uh, just that way there's notice to uh, future homeowners. That would be one possibility. I'm just trying to think of a way to, uh, you know, make clear to those that might be purchasing uh, in the neighborhood that uh, there, there is this pre-existing use, but has any thought been given to how to make that work so that it's clear to those? So there hasn't been any discussion at the city level of that, um, you know, considering that um, that affects the property owners of the people that purchase that land, it, 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 it sounds reasonable to me. It, all, it sounds like something that, um, really the, the owner of the property and developer of the land may ultimately have a, a uh, interest in seeing done. So uh, I'll let you communicate that with the, with the applicant and, and uh, see what they think, but the city has no objection. Okay, and then uh, I guess the final question or final thing I wanted to touch on uh, with you uh, before we move to the applicant uh, had to do with phasing. Um, can you just sort of give a rough overview of what the phasing looks like or is proposed here? And, you know, so in some jurisdictions, there's specific requirements to allow phase development there, you know, in state law, it's changed. Uh, Mr. Schutz probably knows better than I do, but it's changed several times. Uh, at one point up to 10 years was allowed for a phase plat. It was five years, then eight, then 12, I don't know. So uh, I just want to ensure that we have an idea in mind on were this to be approved, you know, how long does the applicant have to accomplish its goals? Uh, so if you could just speak to that. I was just anticipating following whatever the current state law uh, on it is. Um, 
and hopefully, the, I don't know uh, off the top of my head, but hopefully it, it uh, states some vesting, you know, is it eight years from the time that the preliminary plot is approved or I assume that's the way it's presented, but I actually do not know what the current uh, length of time for phasing is allowed. Okay, I don't know off the top of my head, but I will probably be looking it up uh, and I can come back or maybe Mr. Schutz knows off the top of his head. Um, but as far as you know, there is nothing within your own municipal code uh, that sets a time limit on these things. Is that right? So our own municipal code does not specifically address timing. What it does is it says uh, it uh, sets if a five year well, let me make sure I'm speaking about that right. Um, preliminary plat is valid for five years unless extended pursuant to 1608.064. And that, that is as far, uh, we have phased development in 1608.030. Uh, portions of approved preliminary plat may be processed separately for recording and divisions, provided that all the divisions are approved within the prescribed time limits for the preliminary plat and provided that the division does not violate the intent of the preliminary plat. So they have five years. Okay, great. Thank According you. To our code. Excellent. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I don't think I had any other specific questions at this moment. I may have more later, um, but thank you for answering those questions. Uh, finally, I just want to ensure that uh, we're on the same page in terms of the exhibits uh, that uh, were submitted. Uh, so as I noted, these, let's see, let me get that out from the staff report. I believe the staff report had identified the exhibits as uh, A through, through P. Uh, with P being the study area of the transportation element. Uh, so I think that's taken out of your comprehensive uh, planning documents. Um, and then there were several comments, obviously, and I received these two additional comments, uh, one earlier today, I think, and the other yesterday or the day before. And my intent was to add those uh, to Exhibit E, which was the initial uh, series of comments that were packaged together. Does that track with your understanding, Mr. Coleman? Uh, I think I think you can do it either way. If you want to add them as uh, Exhibit E to the existing comments, or if you want to add it as uh, Exhibit Q as uh, comments uh, received during uh, public uh, at, at, at public hearing, that's up to you. Whichever whichever you feel more comfortable doing. Sure, but just to be clear, there were two additional comments. Is that two right? Two additional comments received. You know, okay. Nice. Public hearing. There you go. So I believe one was from uh, the Ronx and the other was from Mr. Hayden, who I think is here and can speak to it if he so desires. Is that yeah. right? Excellent. Um, yeah. I'm getting nods from Nicole, so I, I, she probably put the, the package of exhibits together, so I think we're on the same page. Okay, anything further you wanted to add or anyone else on city staff you wanted to call upon before I turn to Mr. Schutz, Mr. Coleman? No, just except for, you know, we look, we look forward to getting this approved, you know. Okay, well, thank you. So at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it to Mr. Schutz. Mr. Schutz, thank you for being here. And if you could just spell your name for the audio and then explain who you are and that you're attorney uh, and you understand I won't be swearing you in or swearing at you or anything to that effect. Uh, but uh, I do know you to be uh, an honest and trustworthy attorney uh, regardless. But go ahead, Mr. Schutz. My name is Ruben Schutz. That's R-E-U-B-E-N-S-C-H-U-T-Z. I am the attorney here today on behalf of the applicant, uh, Sarah and Laura Bucko. Um, I, I understand I will not be sworn in. I can't speak as whether you'll swear at me. That's a, <laughs> your discretion, but hopefully not. I hope not as well. 
Uh, just a couple of preliminary comments, um, just to echo what uh, Mr. Coleman said, um, there's been a good working relationship between the applicant and the city, um, especially with regard to this development agreement, which is uh, a benefit um, to the city getting this arterial through. It was sort of a complicated process, um, worked closely with the city attorney on good terms and were able to get this um, approved by the council. And so I'm appreciative of all the efforts that went into that. Um, with regard to the project, I think the staff report does a good job of laying it out. Um, I've asked Heike Nelson, who is the engineer for this project for the applicant. Um, she is there under the John Ravnick uh, label, um, if you're looking for the face. Uh, <clears throat> and she's here to answer any questions that you may have with regard to um, technical aspects of, of the plat, um, the site plan, et cetera. Um, but I know that uh, the hearing examiner likes to run a uh, tight ship. Um, and so with regard to that, um, I'd probably leave it to you to ask specific questions you may have rather than go into sort of a long and drawn out um, presentation. But I would like to address uh, one of the conditions. I'd like to ask uh, some questions of Mr. Coleman. And then I have two witnesses um, to, that I'd like to question very briefly um, with regard to the uh, path. Uh, sure, that would be fine with me. Uh, so you had you wanted clarification from Mr. Coleman to start on uh, at least one of these proposed conditions. Correct. Okay, so go right ahead. If we can unmute Mr. Coleman so that you can hear his responses, that will work for me. Good afternoon, Mr. Coleman. Um, I have several questions I'd like to ask, and they pretty much all relate to the uh, condition number three, which is the eight foot wide crushed rock trail. <clears throat> I think you mentioned um, in your presentation that one purpose um, are, of the path is for public access recreation. Is that correct? No, I, I stated that uh, it was for uh, the city to be able to get into there to do maintenance and that the uh and for the homeowners association to be able to get in there and do maintenance as well uh, i stated that there is a public comment requesting a public trail or uh, requesting a trail in there and you can look at the details of of that as far as public or um neighborhood or what uh, and, and I may have misheard when uh, you were you were speaking before. So is it with the city, would, would it be accurate to say the city does not have a position on whether the trail should be open to the public? Well, the you know, city council hasn't passed anything as far as a position on that. Um, so I guess there's no official position besides, you know, it would be, it, you know, we've received public comments that it would be a, a public benefit. So, uh, we don't have, we don't have a strong position on the the public access part. I guess I guess maybe stating a different way, if 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 the applicant was to propose having you know gates placed on there that gave the city access for maintenance but kept the public out, um, would the city have an issue with that? Um. I, I can't speak for the city, so okay. I, it, that would serve that would serve the the public works department and the and the uh, and the homeowners association needs. Now there's, you know, so I, I can't speak for the city about a public trail. Okay, um, a couple just a couple questions on sort of the public access aspect. I understand uh, uh, based on what you've said these are aren't asking your position on on the benefits or 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 whether the city wants it or not but um if the path was put in would it be would it connect to any other public trails to your knowledge um, there's there's no uh public trails uh, besides sidewalks on either side of it so yeah. I mean, there's it's not part of a a regional transfer a regional trail system although there have been requests for uh, making a, a trail system along the Brickyard Creek to serve in the community's interest. Um, so is that, is that got into the planning stage yet or is that just thoughts or ideas that have been floated? Um, it, it would just be ideas at this time. So there's no, no trail planned uh, for that along that corridor um, 
in the six year capital improvement plan or no no financing that's been put forth for something like that? No financing. I can't speak to the six year transportation plan. Um, I can look that up uh, here while we're having our discussion if you'd like. Oh, you can wait. Um, um, I, my understanding is that plat paths are allowed in buffers, uh, but that's not a requirement of the development regulations, is it? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> the project itself has uh, nearly 30,000 uh, square feet of open space parks um, and complies with the recreation amenities under the, the city's code. Is that correct? Um, there's... And I don't want to I don't want to trip you up on the numbers. If if it's the city's position that the project complies with the recreation requirements under the code, that's that's really what I'm getting at. Well, the, yeah, uh, the developer agreement. The overall, it meets the the recreation requirements in chapter uh, was it 1738. And when you say that, just hopping in here, do you mean? it meets the requirement regardless of this trail, uh, meaning, you know, if I'm looking at the plat uh, developed area, there's these recreation tracks set aside and the trail is, is independent of those numbers. Am I understanding the question, Mr. Schutz? And yeah, you actually phrased it a lot better than I did. That is the question, yes. Okay, so can you speak to that, Mr. Coleman? Yeah, as we, as stated in the, <clears throat> staff report the the recreation tracks um which do not include the the pca meet the meet the requirements of chapter 1738 for recreation area so it um it's compliant with the recreation requirements even without the path right? yeah yeah okay um you mentioned uh maintenance um and you disappeared but i presume you can still hear me i can still hear you Okay, good. <clears throat> um, you mentioned maintenance of the of the Brickyard Creek. Um, the creek is a uh, Skagit County right of way. Is that correct? Uh, no, it, it, it's a you know it's a it's a creek, so it's a water of the state. It's uh, you know managed by the city for um, uh, for critical areas per you know, state regulations and per our city regulations. And it's also, uh, the city maintains the, the drainage course. <clears throat> so I was looking at a, um, a document, I don't have it in front of me. Um, and so I may have this wrong if things have changed, but my understanding was that um, it was deeded in part of Skagit County Ditch Di District number 14 um, and uh, was made part of Skagit County right away, at least as to the creek itself. Yeah, that was dedicated back to the city uh, in 10 years plus. Okay, good. Thank you. That filled the in. district uh, went away and, and the county gave it to the city. Okay, thank you. That, that filled in a gap. Um, so the city has maintenance responsibilities for the creek. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> um, the one of condition um, that uh, the applicant is is not not contesting um, is this um, twelve foot gravel access road um, that goes over the existing culvert at the I'd say the northeast corner of the project. You aware of that? Uh, what what is the specific question? I, I guess um, that there one condition is this twelve foot gravel access road. So uh, that was that was actually a request of the applicant to put it there. Okay. Uh, they wanted that 12 foot gravel access road. And so um, that was one of the things that as we went back and forth with the, you know, just what the plan, the, the, the map looked like uh -huh. that we would, um, that we would uh, put that as a, as a condition. So that was, that was the requested. There was some uh, discussion about where it went to and how uh, you, you know, a city would like it to terminate at Thurmond Road so as not to make it look like a road coming off of uh, mm -hmm. FNS Grade Road. Thank you. So that, that's why. When, when you say, I'm sorry, Thurmond, I, and this is something I was hoping to clarify. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's now called Y Road. Okay, thanks. Yes. <laughs> so this would, this 12, uh, 
foot gravel access road um, would connect to the eight foot wide crushed rock trail. Uh, that's how the it's proposed under the under the recommendations, correct? Yeah. And that's how the city would access the eight foot uh, crushed gravel trail. Yeah. Well, and of course, it would also connect at uh, North Trail Road on the uh, on the west side of the where the where the creek go, crosses uh, North Trail Road. Okay. <clears throat> So the the twelve foot access drive would give the city access to the creek. Uh, in in theory, yeah, that would be the eastern outlet through that uh, as as for maintenance through there. And does the city have any other easement rights to cross the property to access the the, the ditch? That would be something I would have to look at with the. Uh, with that access easement that was part of the 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 dike uh, the dike and drainage the drainage district um, and so I specifically don't know the, the the clauses in the the transfer language to the to the city but as my understanding that you know we would have access across anything within the the creek area and I'm gonna hop in for one sec Mr. Schutz I feel like to understand the forest or from the trees, I, this is a lot of questions specific to, I guess, uh, proposed conditions three and four. Does the applicant have an idea in its mind on how you would like to see these conditions changed? Uh, yeah, and I can clarify that, and then and then you can kind of direct my questions if you think I'm getting off track or. Yeah, well, I just if we reverse engineer, uh, yeah, it might help Mr. Coleman understand, and certainly it'll help me understand the point of the line of questioning. Uh, you know, because right now I'm going, okay, I, you know, is there an ultimate? Where are we going with this? I, are you hoping? that uh, you know the trail is deeded to the city and it becomes its responsibility or is that you know i guess kind of what's the idea here sure so um briefly um the the applicant would like the would like the condition removed entirely um, entirely and that's uh, condition three condition three correct um leaving the 12 uh, foot access road for the city to have access to the creek um and if as an alternative if that um if that is not um, acceptable to the hearing examiner, um, then um, a, a gate or some other uh, restriction on the public um, access to that location that would allow the city to come in and, and the HOA, but nobody else. And I assume this is a, what, a safety issue in the applicant's mind? They don't want the public to safety and safety access? And Safety and privacy. I have landscape architect who could testify to his opinion on that if, if you'd like. But yes, that's the idea is people um, hanging out behind their graffiti, um, messing with the plantings, et cetera. Okay, so now that we're aware of kind of where you were ultimately going, uh, I'll let you ask Mr. Coleman what you feel like you want to ask him, but hopefully now he has an idea as to yeah. where all that was headed. And I appreciate that. <clears throat> no um, do the houses or the project itself um, stop the city from accessing the, the creek to do maintenance repair? Do the houses? I mean, does the project? Well, with, without, a, without, a, without a path through there, the city can't drive its maintenance vehicles through there to access the creek. So they, they use a, um, they use a tractor with a, with an arm on it um, and to, to access through the area, all, all the stretch of the entire creek. And so they would continue to, uh, and then what other other vehicles they might need in there to, uh, to tend to any blockages or, uh, you know, landslides or debris in there. So uh, that, that's what, that's the, the maintenance issue. And the okay. vehicles they'll be putting through there. So you would, you would have access on foot from the 12 foot road. Um, the concern of the city is that is vehicle access? Um, well, the, it would, if, if it just terminated, 
if it just gave them access across the uh, the culvert and not all the way through the area, then they would they wouldn't be able to access the whole area. Okay. And considering that we're putting in mitigation planting in there, um, we didn't want to have to drive over mitigated planting. Uh, want to be able to have, get our vehicles in there in a, in a, in a safe and, and uh, manner that's going to respect the, the plantings. Okay. And the plantings themselves, the, the, that's going to be the responsibility of the HOA, correct? Correct. Okay. So the city wouldn't be maintaining the plantings, but there's other issues that they're concerned of with regard to the blockage of the creek itself? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think that's all the questions I have for um, for this witness, uh, Mr. Coleman. Okay, uh, so we can move on from there, I guess, before we do, Mr. Coleman, just to be clear, um, the applicant has indicated it would prefer that uh, condition three that's been recommended be removed um, entirely. Uh, it seems like there had been kind of a back and forth uh, with the applicants in the city uh, that led to this being proposed as a condition. And uh, so in your mind, Mr. Coleman, the, that particular trail uh, wasn't required in terms of obviously open space or recreation or necessarily as you know part of mitigation for the proposal, um, but there are certainly access uh issues and reasons why uh the city would would like to have an eight foot wide crust rock trail at the outer uh, eight feet of that buffer is that an accurate assessment right yeah it's it's it's, ne it's necessary for for access for maintenance and ultimately if i understood you correctly and i'm not trying to put words in your mouth uh the city uh, doesn't have a position necessarily on whether this is a public good and should be publicly accessible, but the city does have a position that, you know, it uh, would like this to exist uh, in terms of the maintenance ultimately of uh, Br uh, Brickyard Creek, correct? That seems fair to say. Okay. I think you, I think you summarized properly. Hopefully, okay. So I, I'll have to think all that through, but uh, Mr. Schitt's anything further based on my sort of summing things up and putting words into Mr. Coleman's mouth, uh, go right ahead. Uh, no, Mr. Examiner, no more okay. questions for Mr. Coleman. Excellent, Mr. Coleman, we might come back to you later. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schitt's, you had some other witnesses then you intended Yeah, on. Uh, just briefly, uh, Peter Dillon. Okay identified as Patrick Dillon. Oh, sorry, Patrick. I'm sorry, Patrick. It's, no it's problem. Yes. I'm going to get you sworn in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in the testimony you give here today? I do. And could you just clearly spell your name for the audio recording? The first name is Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-K. The last name is Dylan, D-Y-L-A-N. Okay. And uh, your specific role uh, with the proposal? I'm a registered landscape architect in the state of Washington. I have an office in Mount Vernon, and I was in charge of the landscape and recreation amenity design for this project. Great, thank you. I'm going to turn you over to Mr. Schutz uh, to ask questions at this point. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I, I would ask, normally I ask briefly qualifications. I know the examiner doesn't like us to go deep into that, so I see that not the shake of the head, and I think we can just move past that and agree that Patrick is a is a qualified landscape architect. Um, and part of being a landscape architect and the expertise involved in that is, is part of that the layout of projects with regard to privacy and safety? Yes, it is. Okay. <clears throat> and in your pre professional opinion, do you have any concerns with having that an eight foot crushed gravel trail abutting owners fences and backyards in this project? You know, when we did the original layout, we had a trail through the buffer, but it was detached and not adjacent to the backyard fences, because the idea was that if there are people in their backyard picnicking or hanging out with family members, if there were members of the public immediately adjacent to that fence, it would, it would deter from their 
quiet and enjoyment and their just general sense of privacy. So uh, when we originally laid out the, the trail, we had it away from the fence. So that way the homeowners would still be able to maintain a sense of privacy. So one, one, one concern is privacy with a thin fence between a public trail and the backyards of the homeowners. Did you also have any concerns with safety or property damage? Uh, you know, typically people will do bad things when it's easy for them to do so. And uh, initially the, the trail had a split rail fence on either side of it. And then there was native plantings between that split rail fence and the property line fence. So uh, with, with that kind of a setup, we felt like there was enough of a physical barrier or separation between the trail and the private property that we were not concerned about vandalism and things like that. But if there's if there's a trail immediately adjacent to the fence, it just seems like it's an easier target. And easier target for what exactly? Yeah, you know, the kids who want to paint graffiti and things like that. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I have uh, for uh, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you're muted, Mr. Examiner. Sorry about that. I was typing a note and I didn't want to make a uh, noise unduly, but uh, I didn't have any specific questions uh, for Mr. Dillon, uh, but I thank you for being here. Um, your next uh, witness you intended to call, Mr. Dillon. Uh, Mary Horenda. Okay. Horenda. Mary Horenda, excuse me. I'm, I'm, I'm blowing it on the names. I'm blowing it on the names today. No problem at all. So I'll get you sworn in. Do you swear firm to tell the truth in any testimony you give here today? I do. And could you just clearly spell your name for the audio recording? My first name is Mary, M-A-R-Y. My last name is Horenda, H-A-R-E-N-D-A. I think you had it right, Mr. Schiff. <laughs> I was just <laughs> noting you're that over, myself. You're overly apologetic. <laughs> uh, it's rare in an attorney. But, uh, and uh, Ms. Horenda, can you just briefly explain your role, who you are, et cetera, and then I'll turn you to Mr. Schutz to ask whatever questions he would like to ask. Uh, I'm the critical areas consultant for the project. I'm a professional wetland scientist and a fisheries biologist with over 30 years of experience in the Pacific Northwest. And I completed the critical areas assessment and the critical areas mitigation plan for the project. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Schutz. So we'll we'll skip over the qualifications and as well for you um, and just get right into. I'm familiar with this witness as well, so yeah. go right ahead. Um, so mitigation planting and maintaining those plantings, that's part of your expertise and part of the role you played in this project? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, and in your professional opinion, do you have any concerns with the eight-foot path um, and where it's located? Uh, I do have some concerns, yes. Could you just kind of give us an overview of those? Right. Um, so I know that the the trail, as it's proposed now, uh, it's not really needed for long term maintenance and access to get to the mitigation plantings. In my opinion, the type of maintenance that is going to be required of these plantings uh, is typically done with hand equipment. So things you carry on your back, in your hands, string trimmers, shovels, clippers, that sort of thing. And so the there's plenty of access points from the road where landscapers could park their vehicles and travel on foot through the mitigation area to do the required maintenance. So, um, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, so correct me if I have this wrong, but what you're saying is, as far as the HOA is, for the HOA's maintenance, you don't believe that the path is required or necessary? That's correct. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, do you have any other concerns with the path in the wet, in the mitigation buffer area generally, beyond the maintenance issue? Well, I mean, in general, when you're talking about buffers, you know, you want your buffer to be intact. That provides the best protection for the critical area. So this buffer is already reduced by half from what the standard buffer is in the code. So this, the standard buffer would be 110. Cedar Woolley code allows it to be reduced by half with enhancement mitigation, as we proposed. Proposing another eight foot trail would then take eight feet 
out of that protective buffer. So now we're down from 55 feet to 47 feet. So that's a concern I have. Okay. And, and there was a there was a path in the original submissions, correct? There was a path in the original submission. My understanding was that was a request requirement from the city. I mean, the, the path was in there in the beginning. I was asked to put a path and maintenance plantings in upon request of the city. Yeah, so your understanding is that it was a city request to start with, the applicant never really wanted a path there. And when, Correct. when there was issues with where the path was, the applicant simply removed it thinking that would solve the problem. Correct. Okay. And then uh, I also have some questions I'd like to get some more information on about where the main access points would be for maintenance of the stream channel, drainage course, whatever you want to call it. Because if the path is at the outer edge of the buffer, that's 47 feet, you know, does the city have a piece of equipment with a 47 foot reach that could reach all the way to the creek? If not, that equipment will still have to be going through presumably the planted buffer to get to the creek to do the maintenance. So that brings up some questions in my mind about you know long-term maintenance and monitoring and somebody has to be responsible for meeting performance standards for the plantings and you know what kind of potential problems that could cause in the future. So and <clears throat> I appreciate you doing my your, my job for me um, and asking the question. I'd like to follow up just briefly on, on that. The 47 feet would be from the edge of the, the crushed gravel trail to the edge of the creek? Correct. OK. And the concern that you have that you've raised is um, that the responsibility of maintenance um, of the buffer is on the HOA. And there are provisions under the code that they could be held responsible and liable if if there if there's issues with that. Yes, and I mean it's typically a person like myself, a critical areas consultant that is contracted to do that long term monitoring, and so there are performance standards that have to be met on a yearly basis for the plantings, and so you know if there was some issue that arose and there was an emergency and the city had to go out and do some maintenance and went through the plantings, that would have to be addressed in terms of the monitoring and whose responsibility that would be to repair that and who would pay for it. And yeah. is your, your concern is that if there's this access there and they don't have equipment that gives them the 47 foot reach that they're gonna do what they need to do and drive over the plantings? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all the questions I have. For Ms. Ms. Horenda. Uh, great. Just uh, my so just to be clear, in your mind, uh, it would be preferable not to have that eight foot uh, trail, uh, crushed gravel trail uh, at the edge of uh, the buffer. Is that an accurate assessment? I mean, that, uh, that is an accurate assessment. The bigger the buffer, the better in, in your mind. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you for clarifying that. And also, you know, free from fragmentation, habitat fragmentation. Sure. I mean, it'd be even worse to put the trail somewhere else if there's a trail. Uh, is that, you know, you don't want to split up Correct. the buffer, uh, you know, uh, so it's sort of, you know, it, if it has to go in, this is the best location, but preferably it wouldn't go in at all. Is that a good summary? That is correct. Okay, I understand uh, your position. I thank you for answering my question there. Uh, Mr. Schutz, anything further based on that? Uh, just a, a couple brief questions for Mr. Coleman. Oh, okay, so are we done then with Ms. Horenda? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horenda. So you wanted to follow up with Mr. Coleman and I will allow it, so go ahead. Uh, just based on uh, what we heard from uh, Ms. Horenda, um, has the, has the city ever used its boom trucks or from this distance to, to maintain the creek? Um, no, that wouldn't be possible. So here, you know, this, it's an unfortunate situation that Brickyard Creek is both a drainage course and a critical area. So we're striking a chord to work uh, the best we can 
while doing well, uh, allowing for the best habitat. Ideally, the public works department would want a 12 foot road right along the creek to get in there, but that's not an, a viable option. So uh, this is this is already a compromise on the city's part to uh, have it the have a trail on the edge for access that is part of the city's requirements to maintain that that uh, that creek as a drainage course so they do have to be in there with their vehicles and um, they need to have access so is it ideal that it's at the edge no and if they'll need to they will have to drive through uh, to access the creek through the plantings, and then uh, that will have to be managed and mitigated. But um, you know, this is—it's we're we're doing the best that we can with the situation that it's not ideal to have to have uh, maintain it as a drainage course and as a critical area. But that is the that is the the reality of the situation, and uh, there's uh, there's state and city requirements that require both so so is it would it be accurate to say that the city doesn't have equipment that could reach it from the eight foot uh crushed gravel trail but it would use the crushed gravel trail to then make its way down to the creek um at certain locations though uh you know i am not the the, the i am not the public works department that would go down there and do so but presumably that's what they would have to do yes and of course we would take as much care as possible um, but they do, they do need access. Okay. Well, and just to clarify further, and if you don't know the answer, Mr. Coleman, that's fine. Uh, but at least conceptually, if I understand looking at the site plan and, uh, where this potentially would go, uh, you know, this would at least at a minimum allow, you know, public works to drive, you know, park on the gravel and then walk down to the creek uh you know all the way along right uh i'm not saying there wouldn't be a situation where they needed to drive over mitigation planting if there was a major emergency or they needed heavy equipment but at a minimum right the the trail would at least provide you know kind of a a jumping off point throughout the entirety of the stretch of uh, the creek in this area. Is, am I understanding that accurately? Right. And of course, they have to go through to do regular inspections as well. So not really expecting them to walk through doing a, a, an inspection. That's not the way that they, they do their inspections. Unless I'm sorry. Uh, are you thinking to inspect so they'll also they also have to go through to inspect occasionally to make sure that there's no problems in the creek because they will not be able to view it from a distance. Well, that I understand, but you're saying even if they have this trail just to do inspections, the city would drive over all this mitigation planting. Oh no, no, they would use the, they would use the trail to access the area to do their inspections. Park, walk, and look, as opposed to do a drive-by, crush all the mitigation plantings. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure I understood or didn't misunderstand what you were trying to explain. So could you clarify for me there, Mr. Coleman? Uh, they would be using the trail to access the area so that they can do their inspections. And they would likely on foot uh, at then, the end know, of the street. Finish the, finish the last part by walking from the truck and over and but they they routinely they routinely access along the creek got it okay sorry to interrupt did you have other questions there mr chutz no I, I think i was done thank you excellent uh thank you uh out of curiosity i have a question for mr coleman and if you don't have the answer off the top of your head fine uh but i guess one thought or question i had uh would be, you know, what is the city's position in terms of, uh, you know, if if it really wants this 10 foot gravel trail that the applicant doesn't want, you know, if the applicant were to, you know, deed it to the city and require the city to maintain it, uh, does the city have any particular position on that? Uh, I, I don't know. 
no, that hasn't been something that we've discussed. Okay. Mr. Schutz, your thoughts. I felt like maybe you were heading in that direction. Obviously, the the hope in your mind, or from if I understand correct, the applicant's mind is let's just get rid of this, you know, eight foot thing entirely. But if, you know, uh, in whatever wisdom or lack thereof, if the hearing examiner decides, no, let's keep it, what are you thinking? Or what on behalf of your client, what is the thought there? <clears throat> sure. So, um, I mean, our thought again, like you, like you just mentioned was to, to get rid of it and that the city can, can, have its jumping off point, um, as was described at the, at the end, you know, where the culvert is and then can walk from there, um, seeing as it doesn't have equipment that could reach from the, the trail anyway. Um, so we'd like it, we'd like it removed. Um, but absent that, our thought was to at least, at least to try to mitigate the concerns with regard to safety, crime, vandalism by limiting access um, to HOA and, and the city. Um, that could be accomplished by security gates and the city would have access, something along those lines. Uh, we haven't talked to the city about the city having responsibility for the entire buffer area um, and taking that out of the cost and, and uh, responsibility of the HOA. Um, right. Which is not what I was getting at there. I was saying just, just that eight foot trail oh. that, you know, yeah, no. In my mind, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, for our concern is not the eight foot trail or maintenance of it. It's it's the safety, it's the it's the privacy, and it's whether it's actually needed. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying, Mr. Schutz. You bet. Uh, did you intend on calling any other witnesses? No, like I said, um, we have um, representatives from the engineering firm who could speak to any questions you may have. But um, I thought that you would have the choice of whether you want to do that rather than us diving into some sort of presentation that's repetitive. Sure. Uh, this is what I'm thinking. Uh, we do have uh, members of the public, uh, at least one, I think a few, um, that may be interested in testifying at this point. Uh, so what I would suggest we do is we move to that portion at this point uh, and hear from members of the public. And uh, then after that, uh, we go back and, and if I have nitty gritty questions on the engineering aspects, uh, we, can, we can do that at the end so as to not bore uh, people to death on details that they probably don't actually uh, need to hear specifically about. So that was kind of my thinking, but would that work for you, Mr. Schutz? It would. Excellent, okay. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, there are several folks that have signed on. I definitely recognize uh, Mr. Hayden's name from his comments. So I was going to suggest I start there. And uh, Mr. Hayden, were you interested in testifying today? Yes, sir. Excellent. I'm going to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in the testimony you give here today? Yes. Sir. And could, could you clearly spell your name for the audio recording? P-A-T-R-I-C-K-H-A-Y-D-E-N. Great, thank you. Go right ahead. And like I said, I believe you had submitted two different comments. Uh, and second one is, unless it was an email to the planner that got submitted, I had a, about a four page letter. I have that, am I wrong? Maybe you didn't submit two comments, I, I don't know. There was I... also an email, there's a typo, I think on the flat that, um, which I'll comment on. We could clarify it later. Uh, sorry, it was uh, Miss. You had a comment initially uh, in response to the NDNS that was issued. I think that was the thing one, a short comment, and then the the long letter that I received. I think uh, yesterday uh, that that I think is what you're referencing. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll quit interrupting you and let you uh, say what you like to say. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, First of all, um, my name is Pat Hayden. I live in Cedra Woolley. Uh, my address is 109 Warner. I, just for background, I used to be the city attorney and I was briefly the acting planner for the city when there wasn't a planner back in about 2005. And I'm currently on the park committee, which is purely an advisory committee. We, they give it, it's a designation of honor and, and no authority. Um, and uh, I used to be a board member of Skagit Fisheries Enhancement, but that was about 20 years ago. But I'm familiar with Brickyard Creek. I'm familiar with its role in the floodway as a flood uh, stormwater conveyance. And I'm familiar with its role as fisheries 
uh, resource, and also to a limited extent as a park or trail resource. There was an effort when I was a planner to try to get a trail all along the entire corridor, um, but I left the city in 2005, um, the civil side anyway, and uh, I don't know what happened to that work. But the comprehensive plan uh, has reference to a trail along either Brickyard Creek or its tributaries, specifically with regard to the SAP road tract of property that the city owns and also with the property owned by fire district number two. These are both referenced in the comprehensive plan. Um, and then there are other references to other parcels and trails in the plan. The plan has a number of policy statements I quoted in the letter uh, that were formally adopted as part of the comprehensive plan. And I'm not gonna go through all those right now. They're in the letter and I adopt it by reference in my testimony, but the plan makes clear that the city wants to promote trails, both as a recreational resource and also as a um, uh, non-motorized transportation element. And so the transportation element also references trails. And trails in critical areas and along um, are specifically referenced and encouraged in the comprehensive plan. And I've quoted those sections in my letter. Uh, is it adequate just to refer to my letter generally for those references? Yes, and I have read it. I have it actually printed out right in front of me, Mr. Hayden, and I don't, I don't I, need to read it into the record, so. I don't wanna bore you by pointing out uh, the many places where it talks about trails and the specific places where it talks about trails in critical areas because they provide, the, the reason for that is they provide a, a cost-effective corridor for trails. The most cost-effective place to put a trail is in an area where you can't build anything else. Second, creeks are really good because they travel the whole distance of something. Um, and so it bothers me that we have a developer who says, oh, well, we reduced the critical area by 50% because we provided some private play recreation areas and some other open space. But now, gee, we don't have enough room for a trail when all along the city was asking for a maintenance trail to begin with. So we're not looking at having reduced something below the threshold where a recreational trail would be a problem. The second thing is Brickyard Creek is the single most important um, natural stormwater conveyance in the city. It goes from the northeast part of the city to the southwest part and into the Skagit River. It uh, totally fills up and flows backwards during a major storm event. And all, all of the city, well, a extremely large part of the city north of Highway 20 drains into this. There's a pretty big area where people can't build. And in terms of weighing cost and benefit, the best place to put a trail is not gonna be on a sidewalk or to buy developable land to put a trail. It's gonna be in an area that you can't build on anyway. Um, second, there's talk about privacy issues. You know, the most notorious trail in Washington is um, the Burke Gailman Trail. And every place that goes, people, whether they're industrial or commercial users or high-end homeowners, they always say, gee, we have a privacy issue. There's going to be vandalism. There's going to be problems. You, if that's the primary issue, you'll never have a trail. What makes a trail safe is design and usage. If a trail is heavily used and it's well designed, it'll do well. So I want to make clear that I'm not asking that the developer build a trail right now. I'm asking that the developer um, convey as part of a condition of development in easement to the city for a public recreational trail. And as pieces get put together over time, and some of those pieces will be on sidewalks and roads, and some are gonna be in natural areas, the city can in the future build a trail. Trails are like sewer and roads. You can't have a trail and then cut a piece out in the middle and expect it to be used. This is a really large piece of Brickyard Creek. It flows from Cook Road uh, up to the, uh, corner of FNS grade road, really. And to get, to omit this piece basically destroys a significant part of a future trail system. Question, you look like- question. Sorry, I'm gonna, uh, Mr. Hayden, based on your knowledge and expertise on these issues, I had a question, which was this, 
Uh, thank you, by the way, for the thoroughness of the letter. I think it really explains the position. As I was thinking this through, one thought I had was, and again, you just pointed out that the success of a trail and the safety issues, you know, are usage, right? And the Burke Gilman Trail is successful in, in part because of how heavily used it is. And in a way that actually reduces things like crime in sometimes in areas because there are so many people out and about. So it's a little, you know, uh, one of those uh, not quite obvious things, but uh, I guess my thinking is, as you noted, your hope wasn't that a trail is immediately built, but the idea is you want to ensure that the, that there's some kind of access easement put in place such that uh, if down the road, a comprehensive trail does uh, develop, you know, adjacent to Brickyard Creek, you know, it'd be possible for, for the city to then at that time put a trail in. So I get that, A, I think I understand you correct. Is that- You, you, you accurately have summarized the request at the bottom of my letter. Okay. And so I guess what I'm thinking is at the current moment in time where there, this trail wouldn't really connect to anything at the moment, which well, I think- Well, it would, it would do one thing. It would provide, um, pit, I mean, I've got a cat that just jumped up in my like Before I throw him out here, you can, he doesn't oh, want to- Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it would provide pedestrian access through the center of this development, uh, and it would bring kids uh, significantly closer to the Janicky play fields from the north end of this development. Um, there's going to be more development north of this system. I know of other applicants who would like to build stuff, and uh, the... Um, primary kids play field in the area is Janicky play field off Cook Road. So this development bridges that area. Some of the access would have to be onto Cook Road, but this would be part of a really good trail system that would run from the developments up as far as um, so uh, Coltis uh, Mountain Estates through the Sock Estate development. It would pick up um, Brickyard Creek development. It would pick up this development if this thing could be constructed. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, some of this access is not going to be able to go on the trail for a variety of reasons, but it because it's a pretty, the time to set aside the right of way is before it gets built. If you try to go in after something is built, it's a nightmare to try to do it. You can't talk 100% of the homeowners to convey an easement. It's really lost forever. The city's never going to condemn a trail. So it's a now or never thing and it's in your hands. I have a few more comments. I think the letter speaks for itself and I don't wanna take a lot of time, um, but I wanna emphasize a couple things. The city actually has a maintenance easement through this area right now. It By defining it as you're being asked, it's probably giving up access rights rather than acquiring more. There are two, um, the city acquired maintenance responsibility from Dyke districts and a sub flood control uh, district. There are two easements noted in the title report for this. I could not find one of them on the county records with the given auditor file number, but I'm pretty sure it's very similar to the first one that I could find. And they both give uh, Dyke District access to um, uh, do this entire piece of property really to do maintenance uh, on the creek. And um, by limiting itself to an eight foot quarter, the city really isn't giving up anything. Excuse me, it is giving up something and narrowing its access and defining it so that this development can occur without those easements being an impediment on the property owners. But I'm pretty sure those Dyke District easements either are transferred by law or are effectively transferred to the city. Plus the city has a prescriptive easement over this because it's been maintaining the system for decades. We've gone to court on one of the sections of property and confirmed that the city has prescriptive easements over drainage ditches that go into Brickyard Creek. So the, se the second thing though is, if the city has such a big easement for maintenance purposes anyway, um, 
and it really needs the uh, road, I think, to get in there uh, efficiently and maintain the ditch as a drainage function because the homeowners aren't going to do it. Um, if it's going to have an eight foot pathway, making that a, um, a trail for recreation really is an, not an additional burden on anybody, at least in terms of real estate acquisition. Um, it can't be developed anyway. It makes it extremely high benefit and low cost to the developer. I do think it is a design question. I think I'm not going to say there aren't legitimate issues about privacy or um, vandalism. You're looking at either very intently or as if you can't hear me. I, can you hear oh, me? I, I can hear you. I apologize okay. for that. Uh, this is why I sometimes turn my video off so no, I don't no, I like people. <laughs> um, I think the, the issues about, oh, well, gee, we might have people there who don't live here. We, we'd rather have a private development. Uh, this isn't the first development that has raised that objection to um, letting the public onto recreational facilities. But I think it's really a question of design. There are a number of things that can be done, ranging from fencing to public use to visibility. Um, to deal with that issue. And it's always going to be there. Everybody would much rather have 100% have privacy, but in that case, we'd never have any trails. Um, so I don't think that's an absolute uh, barrier. You know, I do want to acknowledge, I don't think it's non-existent, but that's partly why I don't think the trail needs to be built right now. I think it's something that needs to be dealt with in the future. There's a city council that would be involved in the decision. There's lots of room for public input. Um, it's a resource question. All I really want to see is the easement for a private a public facility granted as part of this development. Um, sure. And, and that's about it for right now. And if it's not clearly there now, it probably will never be there. This is, you know, the Fisher Cup bait moment. Got it. If, the any other questions or from anybody? I, I, I understand uh, your position. I think it's very clearly laid out uh, in your letter. And as ju discussed just now, uh, this is not an appeal hearing. Uh, never right. I, well, I'm not saying you were trying to appeal. What I was about to say was I wanted to see if Mr. Schutz uh, had any specific questions for you. I, you know, the Fine. rules are a little uh, vague as to if this is the way the procedure would work, but you know, you're a, a, a reformed attorney yourself, I think, Mr. Hayden, yeah. you get how it works. Uh, but Mr. Schutz, did you have any clarifying questions uh, for Mr. Hayden? No, I think the position is clear. Um, I would save any comments I had for argument. Great. Okay, well, Mr. Hayden, thank you so much uh, for participating and for uh, the work you've done these many years uh, in the city of Cedro Woolley. Uh, I, um, yep, that's all good. Um, thank you very much for the time. I'm gonna leave the hearing if you don't mind. Not offended at all. And we'll make <laughs> sure uh, that you receive a copy of uh, the decision uh, when it comes out. Yeah. I believe we have your email, uh, so you'll be, <laughs> Yeah, as a party. Question, question for you. I wasn't sure. Do you take notice of the comprehensive plan just in general or do Oh, we, yes. Oh, you don't have to. Yeah, I, I, I'm the, tr this trails along Brickyard Creek are mentioned and tributaries are mentioned in the comp plan. It's not that they're not there, but they're not in this. Mr. Coleman was correct. They're not in the six year tip for yeah. this. Project. It is. It's purely conceptual, uh, but they Brickyard Creek Trails, and there, there are a couple other, it has a bunch of different names, um, uh, are, um, are in the comp plan. So it's not without a, a planning basis and the policy itself has clear support. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mr. Hayden. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, okay, uh, the next name uh, that I see is, uh, let's see, I have someone identified as Kimberly Lilgreen. Uh, if you yes. Hi, are you folks interested in testifying? Uh, James Ray is, I'm with him, it's just my computer. No yes, problem yeah. at all. 
Okay, I'm going to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in the testimony you give here today? I do. Thank you. And could you just state and then clearly spell your name for the audio recording? Uh, James Ray, J-A-M-E-S-R-A-Y. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ray. Go right ahead. Yes, uh, Kim and I are the property owners, uh, I guess, directly to the uh, be the west. Uh, we uh, butt up to lots one, two, and three on the on the proposal, okay. and our our property runs back up to F and S Grade Road, and I have our parcel number if that'll help. Uh, I think I know where it is, but the address, I, I will, and I can just look that up on Google and see right where your, your property is, uh, if you want to uh, convey that right yeah. now. It's uh, 533 F&S Grade Road. Got it. Okay. And you had some comments you wanted to share? Yes. Um, I'm... Uh, development coming up and we're, we're in support of it. Um, during the process, um, I was speaking to David Lee because we got the letters in the mail, you know, um, about the project. And uh, on this very south end of the project, there's a, looks like an easement. Is that a, a utility easement um, at the end of the uh, uh, project of the development? Is that a utility what is uh, so, that exactly okay so we'll try to uh, rather than have necessarily a back and forth you're hoping to get additional information on uh what yes that thing at the bottom is for one and maybe Correct. we can have mr coleman pull up uh one of the exhibits uh and we can sort of i talk through that so we'll try to get more information on that uh other thoughts there mr ray uh, I guess I have another uh, question for Mr. Coleman about the future of the uh, trail road extension um, and, 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 sewer. and and sewer. Okay, and what were what were those questions? We'll try to get. I'm taking notes, and we'll try to get answers after after we hear from everybody. Okay, well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I, I, in my conversation with David Lee. Uh, he mentioned the sewer would be put in this area here that I just mentioned. And that's because at, at some point we would like to develop our property uh, in the future. We want to hinder it. Yeah. And, and so that that's if we were to be able to axe the sewer from this point. Um, we I don't get, want this project to hinder it. And we don't want this project to hinder it. So. And my understanding, and I'll let uh, Mr. Coleman or the applicant clarify if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that this proposed plat would connect to, uh, let's see, the city of Cedro Woolley sewer system, uh, as opposed to say septic. So I don't know if that clarifies things, but uh, you know, and then the nitty gritty on how if the sewer is coming down, how your property would eventually potentially connect to it is a bit beyond the scope of what I'm being asked to address. But yes, yes, yeah. I understand that. Okay, so uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Ray. So you're you're hoping to get maybe some clarity on uh, what future development looks like in relation to this yeah. property. If yeah, if we would be able to access the sewer from our corner of our lot there and if that's going to be trail road and if what if that blank area is going oh. to be trail road yeah and if that blank area might be part of the trail road extension at some point okay you know, at the south end yeah that yeah so clarification on those those issues yes mm -hmm. okay anything further uh you want to share no that's it Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna check to see if there are any other public comments before uh, we go to try to get clarity on this, but uh, we will try to get some answers for you uh, before I conclude the hearing today, okay? Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, continuing on, uh, I have someone identified as Mark uh, Freiberger or Freiberger. 
Fry would be my guess, but we'll we'll see uh, if this person is interested in testifying. So, uh, Mr. Reeves, I'm the director of public works of the city of Cedar Oa. I was just listening. Okay. Uh, thank you. Did you have any comments you wanted to share? If so, I can swear you in. No, I, I believe that's been adequately covered by uh, the director of building planning. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, two more names. Uh, I have someone identified simply as Bux, B-U-X. Sorry, that's me. I uh, had to switch over to my phone. So this is Laura Bucko and I don't have any comment. Oh, okay, thank you. And then uh, this might be another Bucko, but I have an iPhone, just identified as iPhone. If you're the person simply identified as iPhone, this would be your opportunity. Yeah, that's uh, Tim Woodmancy. I'm just listening in. Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, I believe then we've now uh, called on everyone that's uh, in the room, I believe. Nicole, I'm getting a nod from Ms. McGowan. Yeah, okay, thumbs up. So what I'd like to do at this point is uh, I don't know who the best person would be, whether uh, Ruben can do this or, or Ms. McGowan or Mr. Coleman, I don't care who does, but if someone can pull up the plat map, the proposed plat map, uh, let's on our screen, uh, if that's possible, let's see if we can put that on the screen and then maybe uh, hear from uh, someone on the applicants team or Mr. Coleman to, to try to- uh, uh, I, can, I can address this. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Coleman. I just spoke with David Lee, um, the, our city engineer. And uh, as far as where the road goes, so you can see, um, I use a-, a We can zoom in a little bit. So uh, I believe the, the caller was uh, from this property, Mr. Ray. And the question was about, this is, the, this is North Trail Road. We're planning to continue the sewer and, and stub it right at the end here so it can continue northwards for, along the, you know, wherever the North Trail Road Road will go. Um, and then of course it'll extend as far as um, the feasibly possible by gravity. And, you know, those sorts of details have not been worked out. Uh, you know, we're just at a preliminary plot stage. We're not at the stage of, uh, determining exactly, you know, how deep the sewer is, how far, you know, those, those engineering things have not been figured out yet. Okay. But, but at a minimum, the idea is this plat would be served by uh, the public sewer system. And uh, there would be that sort of stub, stub out so that uh, future property owners were they to develop uh, and further subdivide would be able to uh, stub into the system uh, near the yes, edge of the property line. I mean, that's being planned for to the amount feasible, and we're sure that we can. You know, we're pretty sure that we can get it this far um, uh, up to that northern e extremity, and uh, that will be the underground city sewer. So, properties to the north should have access to it. We just don't know the details of it. Okay. okay. We're definitely yeah. planning ahead to make sure that neighboring uh, properties can develop as well. Did that clarify things for you, Mr. Ray? Yes, you did. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. I, I guess my only other thing to add is um, Mr. Lee added, he, he mentioned it might be around 10 feet deep or something like that, but he wasn't totally sure. Is that, is that kind of a you know, ballpark assessment there? David Mr. Lee Coleman. is nodding at me, yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. And just thank you. Put, and uh, Mr. Ray, just to clarify things, I think originally you had said your uh, property owner to the west, but on this oh. map, are you to the north? Yes, I would okay. be to the north. I apologize. And, and no problem at all. Mr. Coleman was accurate uh, in circling the property that we think is yours. Is that? That's correct. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, uh, we are going to mute you, Mr. Ray, but thank you. Feel free to stick around if you'd like to hear the rest. Uh, hopefully that clarified things for you. And uh, if you can stop sharing the, your screen at this point. Uh, excellent. Okay, so at this point, um, where are we going? Ultimately, I wanted to hear from 
Uh, Ravnik and Associates, just briefly uh, on Stormwater in particular, uh, just wanted some clarification on that issue. And then my thinking would be, uh, we'll go back to Mr. Coleman and then at the end, Mr. Schutz, uh, to wrap things up. Does, does that work? It does from, from our perspective. Excellent. Uh, okay, so our engineer from Ravnik and Associates, if we can unmute her. There Hello. we go. Great, thank you for being here. I'm gonna swear you in. Do you swear or affirm to tell truth in the testimony you give here today? Yes. And can you uh, state your name and then clearly spell it for the audio recording? Heike Nelson, H-E-I-K-E-N-E-L-S-O-N. Great, thank you for being here. And so uh, essentially, uh, if I was just hoping, I, I didn't have submitted, I think I didn't see a preliminary stormwater report, or at least I didn't review one. Um, so I was hoping you could just speak to what the concept uh, for stormwater management for this, this site is gonna be, and just the very basic details, just so I have a, you know, one of the things I need to review under RCW 5817-110 is stormwater, and so I just wanted to make sure I understand what, what is being proposed. Of course. I'm happy to answer, give you a brief uh, synopsis, and you can ask any questions you like. We did submit a full drain engineer drainage report with this preliminary plat application, so I'm not sure why you wouldn't have got a copy of that. I'm more than happy to provide another copy if that would be helpful. I don't like it. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, I, if I could clarify, um, I think there are some uh, reports that were provided um, with, uh, as part of the SEPA analysis. Um, they included the traffic analysis and the uh, drainage analysis. And I don't think those were made um, exhibits for this hearing. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, no problem. Okay, so what I'm gonna, I'll come back to you in just one sec, Ms. Nelson, uh, but from city staff, uh, just for purposes of the completeness of the record, you know, I'm not smart enough to be an engineer, but I uh, at least often will look at these reports and make sure that someone smarter than me has signed off on things. Uh, but I would request that uh, those, those additional reports specifically related to stormwater and traffic be provided as part of our record. And I'll suggest we make those exhibits uh, queue can be additional reports, just so we have a complete record. Uh, any issue with that, Mr. Coleman? I'm sending them to you now. Excellent. Okay, so that clarifies that. But in the meantime, uh, Ms. Nelson, if you could just, again, speak to the basic concept of how stormwater would be managed on site, that'd be great. Of course. Well, we're going to do a range of a bunch of micro stormwater systems on this project. We're really gonna be reaching to um, use as much of the LID provisions as mandated by the 2014 DOE manual to uh, best fit this site, unfortunately, or for, I mean, we have a reasonably high groundwater in areas of this site, which really prohibits us from doing a traditional drainage pond as we're used to seeing in the old school world of doing drainage, if you will. Much simpler to look at, but in today's day and age, we're tasked with much more doing a bunch of microsystems and trying to distribute that water over the entire site. And so, Sorry to interrupt, just to clarify for non-experts that might be watching, when you say LID, do you mean low impact development techniques as identified by DOE and its manual, et cetera? Yes, sir. Thank you for the clarification. No problem. And further, are you sort of, the idea is you try to infiltrate the water on site, and I'll quit interrupting you at that point. Just a reminder that there are probably folks watching that are not stormwater experts. Sure. And, uh, you know, less jargon would be good, even though yes. I hear, hear this stuff all the time. I want to ensure non-experts are, are able to follow along. So Yeah, and well, I appreciate the help. Sometimes I get a little techie. No problem um, at all. What we're going to do is what we hope to do, or what we will do with this project, is we'll be collecting runoff from the impervious surfaces, hard surfaces, such as roadways, sidewalks, things like that, and we'll be routing them to a uh, infiltration system that will be fit underneath the sidewalks. The waters will be treated first in a vault, pre-treated, and then they will be distributed under probably a narrow, maybe foot, one foot depth, depending on the depth of groundwater, um, to sit and be res and 
contained in a reservoir underneath the sidewalks while they can percolate as much as possible into the underlying soils. There will be an overflow, a very, very easy overflow, basically a standpipe that'll allow very large rare storm events that will exceed the system's capacity to infiltrate and let those waters up and overflow out into Brickyard Creek as allowed by DOE. They do allow us to match the existing runoff rates. So with that, we will provide all the mitigation as required by the Department of Ecology um, in the various different ways. And I, I guess clarification on that point. So, uh, so I understand the concept for one, basically, you know, stormwater, rain falls, uh, the, the impervious services that potentially have pollution, i.e. the roads, uh, driveways, uh, that water is going to be rooted and collected. It's going to go into a vault underneath the sidewalks within the plat uh, to be treated. And then the water will be treated as it is percolating, percolating, percolating. Ideally, then it infiltrates uh, into the groundwater table as clean water um, so that we maintain what I think is called hydrologic, uh, uh, the hydrologic flow in the area, if you will. And then in a worst com comes to worst scenario, like perhaps happened a few weeks ago, I don't know, I was not in the area, I was in California, but I saw the news uh, and the amount of rain that, that happened both north of Seattle and south of, uh, of Olympia, uh, quite shocking that amount of rain. So potentially a hundred year flood events uh, which as we out now know is not an event that occurs once every hundred years. It's a, an event that has that probability of occurring, but now they seem to occur all the time. Um, but the, the idea is as a default backup system, that water would be able to be collected and go into Brickyard Creek uh, as opposed to just flowing and impacting adjacent properties. Is that the basic exactly. it, it basically has an emergency overflow. It, it takes a little bit more than the emergency overflow, but again, very rare storm events, like you say, that exceed all what we expect to see on a mass majority of the basis. Excellent. And uh, have you, or has the applicant gone through like a hydraulic project approval process? Is that necessary in terms of work within Brickyard Creek? I, uh, are there any other permits that might be necessary uh, to do the work that will allow that pipe, that outflow pipe, uh, to tie into Brickyard Sure, Creek, discharge. Well, that. first of all, the discharges will make upstream outside of the actual critical area, so it'll be in the buffer. Um, but secondly, we will be preparing a JARPA for this project. We also have a stream crossing with the road, which is going to put a very large diameter pipe through. Uh, we've coordinated with fisheries already on that. Uh, so as a much bigger portion of the project, we'll be dealing with the JARPA for that, but we will also include in that JARPA the dis small amount of discharge of stormwater from the on-site retention, if you will, systems. Okay, so you prepared or will be preparing the Joint Aquatic Resources Permit Application, JARPA. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then that gives uh, uh, notice or involves all the agencies uh, you know, federal and state uh, that would have authority over any aspects of the project that require further review by said agencies. That's how that happens. Uh, I am not in charge of that. I don't need to be in charge of it. I just wanted to make sure, uh, you know, I understood that that potentially was happening and it sounds like it is. So uh, that all makes sense, right? Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, it Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, additionally, house sites will deal with the road water and the public right of way water separately as the city of Cedro Woolly desires. We do not combine them into one system like we see in a lot of places. So we will deal with those under the sidewalk. House runoff waters will be dealt with if they're adjoining Brickyard Creek, they will be uh, designed with dispersion trenches for the roof runoff. Roof runoff is classified as clean water, not pol the non-pollution generating surface by the DOE, Department of Ecology. So that can be freely released and dispersed over the buffer area, which gives it a lot of contact time to uh, hopefully percolate into the ground as well, has more than 50 feet to get to the uh, 
critical area and it's actually really the desi most desired way to deal with the roof runoff. Areas that do not adjoin Brickyard Creek directly will have backyard infiltration systems uh, that they will be able to be stubbed, the roof drain stubbed too. We will promote infiltration in those as well and they will be released by a different control structure. Um, again, just for the up and overflow, a mass majority of the waters will be infiltrated on site. Great. As so that th those are the various micro systems, uh, yes. and then the one big macro system is the one that collects the quote dirty water uh, and makes sure it's treated before uh, it either is, you know, infiltrated uh, or ends up in Brickyard Creek, right? Yes, we will, all water will be treated as required uh, prior to discharging from the site. Great. Um, thank you then for, for clarifying that. That's helpful. Uh, only other question there, uh, you know, there are so many manuals now uh, and some jurisdictions have created their own, but uh, which manual is this being sort of uh, uh, created under or reviewed against? Uh, is it DOE 2012 updates in 14 and 19 or 14? Where, where are we at at this point? Yes, the city of Cedarwood, to my knowledge, has adopted the 2012 amended 2014 DOE manual. Um, however, the way that this project is being designed, it would meet the 2019 criteria as well, but I have not gone through the nuts and bolts and sticks of that just a thousand percent make sure. And as an engineer, I'm always a bit cautious of telling you it would completely fulfill. But to my knowledge, there's no, a matter of fact, the 2019 further promotes what we're proposing to do with this. Um, so, you know, I don't see any worries, even if it were to change moving forward on this project. Great. Thank you so much. Did you have any other thoughts or comments you wanted to share uh, about the proposal or the engineering aspects uh, before we move on? You know, just briefly, I, we've been working on this project for a couple of years with the Bushko family. And, um, you know, they really have a very exciting view of what they'd like to create here in the city of Cedar Woolley. And I too, like everyone else, want to compliment the city of Cedar Woolley and their staff Working through this has been a difficult process um, and it's taken some time, but I think it's gonna be the unique project that creates a, a very nice neighborhood for people to enjoy and live in, as well as a really important thoroughfare for the city of Cedro Woolley. So I think this is one of those fun projects we're all gonna be able to be very excited about in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, before I let you go, I just wanted to see if Mr. Schutz uh, had any questions he was hoping you could clarify before we move on. Mr. Schutz, anything? Uh, for Ms. Nelson before we release her? Uh, <clears throat> I do not. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Excellent. Okay. So at this point, uh, we'll go to Mr. Coleman and see if city staff has any final thoughts, comments, etc. based on everything it's heard uh, today. And uh, in particular, any additional thoughts on the uh, proposed condition three and the issue related to the trail, et cetera. Uh, you, you aren't required to make up uh, your mind one way or the other. You can kick that on to me. I have no problem making uh, decisions that annoy people as uh, Mr. Schutz and Mr. Coleman know. So, uh, but I wanna give you, uh, Mr. Coleman, uh, the floor for any final thoughts on behalf of the city. All right, so um, again, just uh, support of the project. Um, we put the we put condition three in there for a reason. Uh, we uh, have good reason for doing so. Uh, we do need maintenance access into that area. Um, you know, sort of uh, the anecdotally, I, I've spoken with our police department to see if we have any uh, crime problems on any existing trails in the city. We don't have a whole lot of existing trails through neighborhoods, but um, the, the police department said there, we don't have any problems like that. We really feel like it's conjecture that uh, people are saying that there will be crime on the trails. Um, that seems, uh, I don't know, it just seems more like opinion than, um, than fact. So, um, we just uh, we we feel that the, the trail is very important to for the city to have, uh, and that's <laughs> if that's the only point of contention between us and the applicant. I think we're doing pretty good. Sure, and I, I guess uh, 
thinking it through and and I think Mr. Hayden's uh, testimony was helpful on that aspect. You know, there's this idea that if you don't record an easement of some kind now, uh, right, then uh, if 20 years from now, you know, city of Cedro Willie wins uh, a bunch of money, you know, for being uh, such a great place from the federal government. And, and now you can finally build out this trail system. If that easement at least isn't recorded, you potentially run into a challenge of building a trail down the road. Um, so I guess my sense of Mr. Hayden's th thoughts were, you know, at a minimum, even if nobody is building a trail mm -hmm. yet, uh, why don't we have an easement in place uh, that benefits the city, uh, you know, which would A, take care of your access concerns in terms of, you know, being able to park uh, vehicles and get over, uh, you know, to deal with the stormwater uh, system aspects of Brickyard Creek, uh, but then potentially at some unnamed date down the road, if there was funding and, and uh, an actual trail system uh, could go in under, you know, the tip or whatever transportation improvement plan, uh, that would be possible. Uh, so any, any thoughts on that concept uh, from the city, Mr. Coleman? Yeah, um, you know, from a planning perspective, it, it sounds like a great idea to accommodate future uh, future trails and 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 uh, access into that area. Um, and it also isn't requiring any public access to it now currently. So that right. That and so I, I guess in my mind, if that were to be the way I went, right, the understanding is, you know, no trail is no actual public trail is currently being built, uh, but there would be an easement uh, so that in the long term, if a public trail ended up being something that the community wanted to move forward with, you know, then it would become the city's maintenance responsibility, uh, you know, and it would no longer fall on the homeowners to maintain it. Uh, but at least by making it giving those rights now whether they are ever used or not at least you preserve the possibility down the road uh of of a trail system does that track in your mind yeah okay excellent i'll let mr schutz uh speak to this as well but uh any other thoughts uh or comments you want to share mr coleman before i go to mr schutz here at the end i think that's it thanks Great, and I uh, did receive those two additional exhibits, uh, those two reports, and I'm just gonna make those exhibit Q, but essentially those were the stormwater uh, documents and the traffic uh, analysis. So uh, we'll add those to the record. And okay, with that, Mr. Schutz, uh, floor is yours. Go right ahead, sir. Sure, and I, I, I won't beat this. I won't beat this too long. Um, uh, the the applicants is is the applicants incredibly civic minded, and if there was a trail on both sides of this, and they were trying to connect it to a trail system, there'd be no question that they would be open to that. Um, I think Mr. Hayden's comments were were well organized and well thought out, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but this is not the Burt Gilman Trail. Um, what this would do essentially is just allow people back behind fences in a small neighborhood. It'd be a limited little spot back you know, by the plantings where, um, where people wouldn't be able to see what's happening, um, not connected to any other trails. Um, if, if the hearing examiner's, you know, considering um, this, you know, blocking this out for future trail use or something of the like, uh, we'd ask that it, it be, allow the, allow the, the applicant, the HOA to, to gate it. Um, because there's, you know, until such time as it be would become part of a trail system, that way there would be some assurance uh, with regard to our concerns and it wouldn't be a problem with regard to city at city maintenance, so. I'm gonna tip my hand, Mr. Schutz, uh, to the extent that in my mind, it, it made a lot of, makes a lot of sense uh, to A, ensure that there is, you know, uh, access easements, uh, right? So that if 
like I said, 20 years from now, right? It's not the Burke Gilman Trail now, but there's the, the Burke Gilman Trail, as I think you know, took, what, 50 years of, uh, you know, uh, of development and thinking and, and acquiring and blah, 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 you know, and it, it, it was in little areas at, at, at various times. But uh, so in my mind, as you know, it would make a whole lot of sense to uh, ensure that that potential is there and and preserved. Uh, but in the meantime, until this thing became a public trail maintained as a public trail by the city, uh, it would be, you know, just, uh, you know, a gated only accessible by the HOA and the city. Uh, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I would suggest I'll give you a crack at trying to craft something to that effect if you prefer, Mr. Schutz, or I can just do it. But I suspect you'd probably prefer taking a crack at it uh, before I just write it. So what, what's your thinking on that, Mr. Schutz? Um, I, you know, I, I talked about this with the client, some understanding that this was a, a, a potential or maybe even likely outcome um and talked to the the contractor as to what that would look like um and was assured that there could we could we could gate it in a way that um was essentially deterred public use um that was cost effective um and you know if the if the hearing examiner wanted to write in something that that would essentially dissolve or go away come if the trail was to be linked to other portions that would work for us Sure. Okay. Uh, sorry. Are you saying suggesting I just go ahead if I approve this and write condition three in any way I so see fit? Is that, is that the idea? Well, yeah. I guess. I mean, if you, the thought would be that um, access would be limited to HOA and the city. Um, this is just our perspective. Limited to HOA and the city, both would have access. Um, HOA would be in charge of um, constructing the the apparatus. Well, and I guess my only other thought is, if what what preserves the the city's right, uh, you know, to, I mean, is there a recorded easement? Ultimately, I, that's to me preferable to the extent that you know, even if the HOA is maintaining it and the HOA installs it, you know, by recording an easement, uh, you know, uh, just solely related to access for the city, right? Um, it, I would want it phrased something to the effect of, you know, uh, an easement shall be recorded allowing for uh access by uh the city uh the city staff to the eight foot trail uh and moreover should uh you know the trail become part of a larger public trail system you know th then that eight feet or whatever would would you know i i'm trying to think through the no, I, I understand it, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I without speaking to my clients, I can't say with specificity. My, my gut is that an easement would be preferable to dedication yep. um, and that um, there be parameters on the city's use um, limited to maintenance. Yeah, which is why I was going to give you a shot at that. Yeah, at, that's <laughs> so I will take you up on that offer. Um, I will take you up on that offer. Thank you and um, draft something for your consideration. and. How about this? Today's Wednesday. I mean, if you put something together and maybe have Mr. Coleman or, you know, someone on his staff, if it's not him that has expertise, uh, maybe public works should look at it too, if they're the ones using the trail. But, you know, if, if there's sort of an agreed proposed condition, let's just assume if I approve this thing, I, I do want, you know, the the access easement to exist were I to approve this. So I'm not going to eliminate condition three. So I'm giving you an alternative, which is see if you can work with uh, city staff and come up with sort of an agreed condition that captures this idea. And uh, would Monday be a reasonable amount of time to try to put that together? If you can do it quicker, fine. But I'm just thinking you need to talk to your clients, talk to Mr. Coleman, let Mr. Coleman weigh in, et cetera. But my thought was Monday, but go ahead, Mr. Schutz. I think Monday is reasonable. 
Yeah, Mr. Coleman, does that make sense to you? And Monday's a holiday. Sorry, uh, Martin yeah. Luther King Day. Well, I, so Tuesday would be uh, it'd be the 18th. Mr. Coleman, that. Yeah, so I'll have to coordinate with our uh, public works department and whomever, whatever else, city staff, to 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 review it. And we'll need a little time to to look at it. So what's a, what's a reasonable time frame for us to then get it back to you to help you finish your determination? Well, I mean, I guess my thinking was Mr. Schutz will talk to his clients uh, now or at worst tomorrow. I know he's uh, quick on the draw and competent and can put something together pretty quickly. Uh, and so, you know, is the thinking he gets it to you by Monday? In my mind, I was thinking it comes back to me by Tuesday. But if you think that's not enough time, you know, I don't want to rush something uh, as important as this to the extent that the whole point of crafting this condition is a thought, you know, long term uh, in terms of both this property and, and any potential future trail system. So I'm not trying to rush anyone. I also don't want to needlessly hold up uh, the project. But uh, what's uh, Mr. Schutz, if you got Mr. Coleman something, my could you do it by Friday or would you prefer Tuesday uh, on your end? I can do it by Friday. Okay. So if Mr. Schutz gets you something by Friday, Mr. Coleman, in your mind, what would be a reasonable turnaround to then go ahead and, you know, get it over to me after you've thought about it? Um, well, honestly, I don't think we'll be able to get the people we need to look at it on Friday. So <laughs> you may as well take till Tuesday if that works better. There you um, go. And then uh, I'll need it to route it to at least a couple of people for to review. So I would love to get it out in, if we get a chance to look at it Tuesday, Wednesday, get it to them on Thursday. Is that, I, I don't wanna draw, draw this out. I just can't account for other people's schedules. So I, I can't guarantee when other people are gonna have a chance to look at it and if they need to go any back and forth. Sure. Um... I think it's reasonable to say the 20th, uh, Mr. Schutz, your, your thoughts. I mean, ultimately that gives both sides time to kind of try to hammer something out and then get it to me approximately <laughs> one week from, from today when accounting for Martin Luther King day. That'll work for us. Excellent. So Mr. Coleman, make every effort, uh, to work with Mr. Schutz and I don't care who gets it back to me, but have someone, uh, you know, produce uh, what we'll call proposed condition three uh, and get it back uh, by uh, next, be next Thursday by the end of the day. Uh, and then the record can close at that time. Okay. And, so, you know, just so everybody knows, my intention is not to drag it out till Thursday. That is the, le the last thing I want to do. I want to move this as far as fast as possible, but just I can't account for other people's time frames. Absolutely. I, I think we're all, we all understand that, I think. So um, anything further uh, from you there, Mr. Coleman? No, thank you. And Mr. Schutz, I just thought of something I had meant to ask earlier. Um, I had way earlier in the hearing, I had talked about that uh, letter that came in from the Cedro Willie School District related to the bus depot. Uh, have you run into a situation you know, comparable in the past, you know, I've, I've had proposals where, you know, you, you just put something on the plat documents or the other option is it's, uh, you know, referenced in the HOA materials, but essentially you're trying to put new homeowners right on notice that there's this strange pre-existing use that has some arguably potentially detrimental impacts. But in this instance, Buses have to go somewhere. Buses are important for, for our school system. Uh, so if folks move in to uh, this, this property, uh, you know, the, essentially the school district's trying to uh, ensure that they were, folks were put on notice so that, you know, they don't feel uh, that they have grounds to complain later. Uh, but your thoughts, Mr. Schutz, on a solution in advance to that potential issue? Yeah, thank you. I, I have not 
I don't have personal experience with that on a plat specifically, or even outside of just the general disclosure requirements in the sale of property. Um, I imagine that some of my partners have, and I'd love the opportunity to get their thoughts on it, and I could provide um, provide that at the same time we provide the the yeah. other document to you. You read my mind. So I, in my mind, I think it would be useful to try to address this one way or the other. And I'd be willing to, uh, you know, let you uh, work through this, talk to your, your other uh, experts and say, hey, you know, uh, here Examiner Reeves had this crazy idea. Has anyone run into this before? What's a good solution? And uh, whatever they come up with. Uh, I doubt Mr. Coleman would have any issue uh, on behalf of the city, uh, you know, whether the solution is put something right on the face of the plat or include something in the HOA uh, in terms of notice, uh, you know, I think it's beneficial. So um, I'd be curious to see what you come up with, but uh, you have that opportunity. Uh, I would request that you loop the city in on whatever you come up with and I'll look at it. And uh, if it's sensible to me, I will probably add that as a, a condition. Okay. Make sense? Yep. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Coleman, no issue on that as well. No, I appreciate it. You know, it sounds like we'll be probably communicating, you know, our departments and maybe our city attorney is already going to be communicating with uh, Ruben on the, the trail condition issue. And uh, so we'll be working together um two birds one stone what what time specifically did you want to have the record closed on the 20th uh i mean up to you i i'll count i'll treat the record as closed on the 20th but i i'm not gonna okay get it to me after five i'm not gonna then all of a sudden decide the record really closed on the 21st so uh, I'll give you up until midnight on the on the date, but I'll treat the record as closed uh, whenever it comes in. Just want to be working with clear expectations. Thank you. Yep, uh, we all appreciate that. Uh, so, Mr. Schutz, uh, that thank you for for uh, dealing with that particular issue. I now want to give you an opportunity to any final thoughts, comments, argument you wanted to make. Uh, this would be your opportunity before we call it a night. No, I think I think we have it covered. I appreciate everyone's time. Oh my God! I just gave an attorney an opportunity to speak <laughs> that way. Clearly, Mr. Schutz has places to be. We all do. It's past five. Uh, it, this uh, clearly a, a big project, uh, somewhat complicated. Uh, but I do appreciate everyone taking the time uh, to be here, to participate in the process, to answer my questions, Mr. Schutz's questions. Uh, I believe I have a clear understanding of what is being proposed. Uh, so what I will do is, uh, you know, review everything that that's come in already. Uh, well, further review it. Uh, but I am going to look at those uh, stormwater report and, and traffic report that I have not yet reviewed. In addition, we have a couple other things I'm waiting on to look at. Uh, but I will take all of this under consideration once the record closes and produce a decision on the proposal within 10 day. 10 business days of the record closing. Uh, and uh, that'll wrap things up. So we'll treat the record as closed. Uh, the intent is May 20th, uh, or May, where did I come up with that? January 20th. Uh, clearly I've had a long day too. Uh, January 20th is, is uh, when the intent for when the record will be closed. And uh, again, I'll take everything under consideration and timely produce a decision within 10 working days after the record closes. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and end today's meeting. And I just want to say, I hope everyone had a nice holiday season and I uh, hope everyone is safe and healthy. I, you know, this crazy world we're living in, I, I got notified yesterday that someone I have close contacts with got diagnosed positive. So I was supposed to actually hold an in-person hearing in Pierce County this morning. And I said, nope, not coming in. We're going to use Zoom like everywhere else. Uh, I feel fine, but uh, I just wanted to uh, tell everyone, I wish everyone safety and good health, regardless of what happens on this particular proposal. So thank you, everyone. With that, we'll end tonight's meeting. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you.